Okay, so good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's webinar. Tonight's webinar is on the player education webinar series, and it's work-life play, the balance for players. That's what we're hoping to explore throughout the next 60 minutes. Um, my name is Claire Dowdle, and I'm the Ladies Gaelic Football National Development Officer for uh, Darren Croke Park. And with me this evening, I have Aidan McLaughlin, who is our Ulster Development Officer. If you want to say hello there, Aidan. How are you doing, folks? I'll keep and, it short and sweet, Claire. Aidan has a load of experience in, in balanced players, as a, known as a very top coach in and around Derry. So hopefully he'll be able to share his expertise and tips with us tonight. And we're delighted to have online tonight with us Siobhan Woods. Siobhan is a Dublin senior ladies footballer. Um, I think she's won everything that can be won, if my records are, are correct. She, she might uh, say otherwise, but I think she's an under 16, a minor, under 21 and senior All-Ireland medals. So it's a big accomplishment. And she's a student in DCU and she's doing a PhD at the moment in the psychology department. So we're just delighted to have Siobhan on board this evening. So hello, Siobhan. Thanks, Claire. Delighted to be here. That, that was a wee surprise welcome for you. I don't think you knew you were getting that. <laughs> <laughs> so folks, the aims of tonight's session is to explain the role of, of prioritising to strike a balance. And that's what we're going to talk about in re re relevant to it all is striking the balance. Explain the importance of goals and planning, key ways to communicate with coaches, and spotting signs of demotivation. What we're trying to say is we know people have so many different schedules, so we can't say here's a plan. Um, this is what if you do this, you're not going to suffer from any stress or you're going to have a great balance in life. What we're trying to say is here's some tools and hopefully you can apply them to yourself and strike that balance. And that's what we're hoping you get some tips and a tool set out of this evening's course. So just to start off, I'm going to throw in a poll just to get everybody thinking. And it's just a few questions. And the first one's very easy. What is most important to you in your free time? And I'm going to put it up in the screen there. And hopefully you can pick. Is it A, studying or work? B, catching up with friends? C, Netflix? D, additional training? Or E, scrolling through social media? What trap do we all get stuck in? A really good variation coming through, folks. There's about th 35 out of the 50 have answered. So let's have a look what that looks like. You can see there from our results in our free time, 39% like catching up with friends. That, that's something. Um, I used to like to do before COVID. Um, and, and now I would definitely be one of the C's. I would definitely be a Netflixer flick. It's now, I love, I love a bit of that. Um, but you can see there's a variation between studying and Netflix, social media. We, we can get caught in uh, that TikTok and scrolling. And uh, of course, there's the 22% that like to do a bit of an additional training. So it's a great priority. And it's just something to, to see there coming up. Um, but I'm glad a lot of people have picked friends. A few more things I'd like to ask, and I'd like you to be honest because nobody can, we can't trace this back to you. So be as honest as possible. Do you set yourself regular goals? Okay. Um, yes or no? I just want to see what we're looking at. Like, would you take the time to set yourself regular goals? And you can all see from that, 78% said yes, they would set themselves regular goals and 22% said that they wouldn't. Um, goal setting is something we're going to speak about tonight because it's so important when we talk about having a balance in a lifestyle. And it's something that I, I feel sometimes you forget about. Um, and we'll just go through some really simple tips on setting goals and, and why you should be setting them, I suppose. And the last one, do you have a weekly or monthly plan? So when you're setting up for the week or for the month, do you have a plan? So would you sit down and write a plan? 
on a Monday or a Monday morning or a Sunday evening or a Friday evening? Do you set yourself up, up for the week or do you set yourself up for the month? Do you have a calendar and you go, this is what I'm going to do. This is when I'm going to train. This is when I'm going to study. This is when I'm going to work. Um, And we can see here, from setting goals to having a plan, um, the results have changed. 48% of us have said, yes, we do. And 52 have said, no, we don't. And I think that's being true and it's common. A lot of people don't put down plans in place. And hopefully by the end of tonight, you'll see why it's so important to have a bit of a plan in place for you and how it can help you. So I'm gonna go through a few definitions, okay? so. The title was work, life, play, striking the balance. So work, work actively involving mental or physical effort done in order to achieve a purpose or result, especially specific tasks done as part of the routine of one's occupation or for an agreed price. Life, the existence of an individual human being or animal. Play, engage in activity for enjoyment and recreation rather than a serious or practical purpose. So that's actually our definition of them three meanings. Um, and the big thing I would always say is let's see how we get on striking the balance. Work is what we all say. Most of us have to fit in no matter what because we have to pay bills or we need money to live. So it's important that we have that in there and we have the time for it. Life, when I put that in the, in the small contents, I would say life is hopefully living it to the maximum. You know, it's what you're doing. You're living and breathing it um, and you have to be happy with it. Play is engaging in that activity for enjoyment. So whatever way you get that enjoyment through play and, and to, to make our, our life, I think, happy, we have to balance it all, our work and our life and our play. Um, and it can be really challenging when we when we explore all the things that we have to fit in. Uh, and, and hopefully, as I say, we can give you some tools to help. Oh, I just went to the end there. That was a quick webinar. So what I'm going to ask you to do, just to get you involved, um, can you list the common things you need to fit in your life? So you're thinking of yourself personally, and you can see in the chat there, need to let me know what's coming in. If you can list or write something down that you need to fit in your life. Sport is the first one in there, Claire. Work. Yep. So sport, work, training, sport keep coming up. Family, it's good to see. Schoolwork as well, yeah. College. All big ones. I think a big one there is relaxation, sleep. Yep. School, training, family, meals, time for yourself, yeah. And all like, and they're the common things. They're just the bread and butter when you're thinking about a plan or when you're thinking about setting anything that you have to consider. Meals seems to come up here quite a bit as well. So probably prepping food at the start of the week, sleep, college modules, college placement, exercise, cooking and training. Yeah. And I suppose I just sort of put them down and I'm glad I didn't miss out anything. I don't think that he's mentioned there. Sleeping, a whole part of everything is you need to have an adequate amount of sleep. And that's something you have to consider. You can't burn the candle at both ends. So three or four hours of sleep just aren't livable. You have to be able to be able to rest, especially if you're training, you're working, you're studying, you have to be able to have a sustained bit of sleep as well. Eating, and Aidan alluded to it there, you know, where do we find time to make these nice healthy meals? Where do we find time to actually sit down and eat through all of this? Um, to prepare and prep our meals. Attending classes in school, it's always really important. That's something that we have to keep you up, keep you up to date with. Our studies, exams, keeping on top of modules, assignments, online learning, it's all coming up over and over and over again. We have our family and then free time. A lot of people said at the start, they like to go and socialize with their friends, which is natural. Then work if we need our money. Doing messages or chores, so just going out and having to collect something or pop into the post office or you know some daily things pop in and get milk or whatever you need daily chores then we have our training and our matches then we have to think of 
are we playing two sports, three sports? How many sports teams are we on? I mean, what number of teams are we involved in? And you quickly realize if you sit down and you list everything that you have and that you have a really, really limited amount of time to invest in training matches and other things to enhance your game. By the time you fit it all into the circle, you're thinking, where can I find that wee bit of time to fit in that, that extra bit of training that I have to do, that extra wee bit of skill session, that extra core work. Um, you really realize that days are short, weeks are short. And in order to maximize it, you have to make all these considerations and see how we can fit them in. So I'm going to talk to you about setting your goals as, as a main part one. And I think it's really important because if you think of everything that we had to consider there, it's really important that why are we doing this, that we'll have a reason behind it. And one of that is goes by goal setting. And I'm not going to go really deep into it. I'm just going to touch base on it really for you and give you a feel of it. So goal setting is a skill that you can use to maximize your performance. It involves identifying what you want to accomplish and devising a plan to assist you in fulfilling your ambition. Setting goals help you feel more in control, maintain motivation, increase effort to push harder, build confidence and concentrate on the important things that provide you with the direction. And I think that's really important. Goal setting can be a real good motivator because you're saying, this is what I want to achieve. And when you achieve it, just tick, tick off the box and on you go again. And it can be really, really important that you have them to help your motivation and your confidence. The more you achieve it, the better you feel. Um, and it's really important that you break it down. So goals can be short term, as in, I want to do this today, um, weeks or long term, months, years, depending on what target you have. However, your short-term goals must lead into a long-term goal to make it worthwhile. Make sure the small wee bits you're doing make a difference for your overall goal. So if your overall main goal was, look, I, I want to start in our senior team this year at centre half back, um, then your short-term goals are what's missing in my game that I need to improve to get to that stage. And you're gradually putting it up until you reach the goal. Or it can be anyway, but you're always building your goals up together. Goals should be reviewed, and I think that's really key. And it's something that sometimes we forget to look at. We should be reviewing our goals and going, okay, does this goal need to adjust? adjust it? Do we need to make it harder? Do we need to make it easier? And we shouldn't just be leaving it packed where it is. And we should always be reviewing and looking accordingly to see where we can adjust it. And what I want to say, and this is the big thing about goals, is your goal should be smart. I'm sure you've heard that at this stage about smart goals. OK, and what that means is how do you can how do you achieve them goals? So people talk about what your goal is, but how do you achieve that? Smart goals are something that you set milestones in. So I want to achieve this by week one, week two, week three or whatever way you want to do it. You're specific about it. So about how to reach the goal within a time frame. If you put a time frame onto the goal, it can actually help motivate you towards it. Make your goal actionable. So if I do this, I'm going to be able to achieve it. Then put your actions into the schedule and you follow through. There's no point in writing a goal and then you never look at it again. You don't look at it for until six months and someone asks you and you go, oh, I forgot all about that goal. Um, and we've used this thing before and it's it's the wee goal rocket. And you'll see it on the right hand side of the page here. And I, I just think it's brilliant. Um, it's called Shoot for the Star. And we're saying is what you should be trying to do at the start of the season or even if you, you forget to do it to start, you want to do it halfway through. What's your dream goal? So put them up there. They're your really long-term goals. That's, that's what you want to achieve. That's your dream. Then you put in some long-term goals underneath that. Just two or three key points. How are you going to get to them long-term goals? A few wee short-term goals. And then if you really want to push it, and a lot of people you can see are doing it now, daily goals, journal. And I know it's something a bit different, but you know I would actually do weekly goals every week. For myself, I'm coming back from an injury as well. So I, I have obviously a long term goal, but I always set weekly goals and even for my work daily goals. And I would just be sitting in my diary and every morning writing them down. And then I, I love the end of the day ticking. You know, that's nearly my favorite part. But I have them there in front of me. And I think if you're going to set goals and you want them to be realistic and for you to work towards them, you have to write them down so that you can see them. Um, and I'm just going to throw Siobhan on there and ask her about her goals. How, what's her experience with goal setting and, and would she set herself goals? Yeah, no, I completely agree with you there. I think that 
probably the idea of the daily goal setting is what we struggle with most and the, the short term goals. So I think when you see about people um tend to say they do have goals, but then they don't have the plan as frequently. So it's going to be easier to say, OK, I want to I want to be a starting forward on my team. But then to think about, well, what will that take on a kind of session by session basis? Let's look at it from a football perspective. If you want to have kind of actionable goals that are session by session, I think something that you can measure, you know, we look at those smart goals, it should be measurable. So if you can think, well, if, if I speak my manager, what's he looking for from a forward? He wants someone that is going to score and say he's going to win their ball first time. So if you go into a game and you may maybe are scoring two out of four shots, you can start measuring that and setting yourself a goal for the next game. Okay, I'm going to score three out of four shots in the next game um, and kind of push on in terms of your percentages for shooting or if you're kind of maybe having given away two balls at a game, you want to work on that and lower that. So set numbers on those value, on those kind of skills within a game environment or equally now when you're training by yourself and going out doing the, you know, the shooting drills or whatever skills you're doing, put a number on that. And it doesn't have to be, you know, every session, but you can say this week, at the end of the week I'm going to assess my shooting and I'm going to aim for whatever 70% scoring next week I'm going to push it up to 72% and see how you progress there so I think definitely having kind of numbers where you can see your progress is the biggest thing because it, it does motivate you going forward and you can look back and say okay five weeks ago I was only hitting 50% of those shots and now after the work I put in I'm up to 70% so I think definitely I would put a massive emphasis on the daily goals probably above and beyond the kind of the end term goal because that's the thing that keeps ticking along day by day and I'm the same as yourself come back from injury now and um, I did my cruise shit and that's kind of a, a nine month thing where the end goal is to be back playing but if you're looking ahead to those to that nine months time everything can get lost in the process along the way so I think definitely um the more frequently you can set goals and assess your progress, the the better it'll, and easier it will be to kind of to see your progress and to motivate yourself. And from my experience, then we then we daily goals help keep you motivated. That's what I find as well, especially in this climate that we're in as well, Siobhan. Massively, like everything is so uncertain now, and there's very little that we can control in terms of what's happening. But the one thing you can do is to decide kind of what what type of training you're going to do yourself in the in these times, what you're going to focus on. And you can kind of get encouraged of seeing that progress because it can feel like you're just kind of floating along with everything going on now. So I think definitely even more so than than normal, that setting those daily goals now can, can be a massive thing and a great way to implement it and why you might have a bit more kind of time at home or a bit more control yeah. over your schedule than you would previously. Definitely. And and the goals, I suppose the, you probably think um, we're going to get to why they all link in, I suppose, but goals are really important to, to set out the first stall on any type of balance and it sort of then brings you to the next thing that comes hand in hand with your goals and the, and the balance of everything we're talking about is managing your time and it's something people really struggle with is managing your time and um, because if you're anything like me you nearly say yes to everything and then you just you can get lost sometimes of trying to work through it all so managing your time is really important and I've seen this and I just think it's super it's actually called the pickle jar theory, but um, I'm going to use stones and sand instead. And it's regarding time management. So what it's telling you to do is what are the rocks in your life? So the rocks are something that are priorities, the most important things. And that's what we have to decide. And this is why I say it's an individual thing. What are your rocks? What is your priority? Um, you know, then you have your pebbles. You know, they're your smaller tasks, your urgency. So they're they're important, but they're not as important as the rocks, but, but they're still important. And then you have the sand. And some people might say the sand's a bit of a distraction. It, it, it can be your leisure time, or it can also be that time you need to relax. Um, and you're trying to fit them all into the jar. And this is actually a theory. The jar is your time. So the jar is life. Um, and it's your time. And if you try and put all the sand in first, then the pebbles, then the rocks, it won't fit because you're being distracted and you get smaller tasks and it's eaten away. And the biggest thing you actually want into the jar is your rock. But by the time you get to put the rock in, there's no time left. So what we're always saying and what we would encourage you to start thinking of is what are your rocks? Put your rocks into your jar first. Okay. Then you can fill in between your rocks with your pebbles. When you put them in, they filter in between. And then even when they all the pebbles go in, if you try and put some sand in, there's still space. 
but at least if you don't have time for sand, which is your leisure, your rocks are already going to be being achieved. So that's what I really want you to start thinking about. And I think if you take anything out of tonight, it's what are my priorities? And that links in with your goals. So are your rocks study, sleeping, training, nutrition? You know, what are the most tasks important for you? You have to decide that. The coach can't decide that. Uh, the team can't decide that. You have to decide what are my priorities for me, the most important thing for me in my life to make me happy. Um, and then you fill it up with your, your smaller tasks, you know, things that just maybe you can do or can't do without. They're just not as important. And then, as I said, in with the sand. So, you know, what is the, the ones you would like to do? And to, to keep the balance on it, you have to keep it on track. You know, if you fill the jar in the right way, there'll be room for everything. And that's what I would say. But the priorities keep you balanced and on track. So if you can work them out, it's going to keep you on track. But you must decide what they are. And just on that, OK, knowing your schedule in advance and writing it down is a great way to manage your time. So people laugh about this, but it's really true. Knowing your schedule and writing it down can help you manage your time. That is the biggest aspect. And this is a really way that you can start managing your time. And this is a really simple exercise. Just what we talked about there. You have three columns. The important things, somewhat important, not very important. And that's your three columns. So step one, set aside some time to actually be organized. So approximately or 20 or 30 minutes over the weekend, I would always do my planning on a Sunday evening because I'm get, I love just thinking fresh week, fresh week. And that's just my own mindset. Some people plan on a Friday or on a Wednesday, whatever shoots their week in their life. My, mine is a Sunday evening. And you're planning for the common week. So step two, prioritize, pick for me, what's important to me that I must achieve or what, what I want to do. So whether that is, you can see there, you know, training or matches or I need to get me, I'm doing rehab. So I need to, I have to get out for 40 minutes every lunchtime, no matter what's happening. That's a priority for me. That mightn't be for somebody else, but for me, I have to do it because I'm working in the evenings, et cetera. But you make a list of what the important things are and allocate time to them. So here's 30 minutes here, 40 minutes here, 50 minutes here. Weekdays and weekends can be very different. It is recommended that you review them separately. So don't treat every day the same because they are different and the time that you have will be different according to it. Step three, print out a weekly planner or some people would do it now. Save it on your notes and your phone or take a picture of it and have it as your lock screen. So you know this is what I'm supposed to be doing here today and it's, it's touches a button. We all look at our screen a couple of times a day. So it's something really easy to do. Um, and remember to input the important stuff first. So even everybody is something different to them. It might be, look, I really want to pass my driving test. So it's really important for me now that I'm making sure I fit in at least one driving lesson a week or, or whatever your priority is. It's up to you to look at them. Step four, set two goals for the week, possibly things you've been putting off for a while, i.e. starting an assignment or booking a driving lesson. So out of that week, have a goal, you know, and that will help you. Add in anything else that's important. It's important to have a balance in your life. Ensure you've left space for downtime, friends and family. And that's really important. You know, we have to put them in the priority list if it's important to you. If you feel better having a chat with a friend, then put that in your plan. If you feel better going and grabbing a coffee, or as I said, having the lunchtime walk, it makes me always feel a hundred times better. You know, put it or something you want to do for yourself. If you want to learn something new, put away an hour a week put them into your plan. But if you write it down, it's going to really, really help with your time management abilities. Um, and you can see that then you, you have your lists important, somewhat important, not important, and you figure it out that way. If you look at this, okay, this is just an example of a weekly training template or tracker. So we talk about times, you know, players can very easily do up their own profile sheet, name, team, you're listing your team, training days and duration. So I know what it's like when I was growing up, I played um, ladies football and camogie and basketball. So, you know, you were always thinking, what am I doing this evening? What time's training at? What am I moving on to? And um, if you have the plan and it's wrote down, you know, this is what team I'm with. Even if you're just playing one sport, you might be playing for three or four different teams. You know, schedule what you're doing. What's the training days? What's the duration? Is there a match day as well? And then have in it what type of training you have. You know, is it a match? Is it fitness? Is it gym? Is it cardio? Is it strength? Is it conditioning? Is it ball work? 
and you have it all in there and how long it is, that means you have a weekly plan of your actual training and then you can think, you know, I want to get better at this skill, where can I fit in time to add to that? Or you can even just show this to your coaches so everybody knows, look, this is what she hit on this week. Because sometimes you might be going from one coach to another or from maybe under 16 the adult and the adult coach doesn't know that you already had a 16 session and two matches that week. So if you even keep a diary of everything you have, it can really help you to keep fresh and on time with it. Um, I suppose regarding that and the last thing and just to finish up the time management piece is something I think is really important productivity is never an accident it is always the result of commitment to excellence and intelligent planning and focused effort so basically what that's saying is getting where you want to be doesn't come by an accident you have to put the hard yards in you have to plan your sessions and you have to try and be focused looking at the time that you have and what you want to achieve. So matching what you want to achieve to your time. And, and I might just ask Siobhan to come in there again, seeing if she has any strategies she would use regarding her time management, because I know you're really busy with all your stuff. Yeah, I think, um, I suppose, generally speaking, when we're not in lockdown and you know you have to be at training at this time, um, it's kind of working around that. So everything else kind of is secondary. So you'd be training at seven o'clock. I know I have to get all my work done before then. And I think now um, it might even be more difficult with the kind of extra flexibility that we have. So the more flexibility that you have, the more kind of decisions that you have to make around how you plan out your day. So obviously um, there's no collective training. So you don't probably have to be at training at a certain time or do your training at a certain time. So that kind of puts more responsibility on you to decide when that's going to happen and to, and to plan out your day and um, like you're saying so I think for me now I think something that I've been trying out is kind of looking at what what suits me best now that I do have that flexibility so if it's dark in the evening is it better for me to get out and run during the day is it better for me to get out and run early in the day is that when I'm most productive with my work so first thing while you have that bit of flexibility that I would suggest is kind of exploring what might work work best for you so you're not constricted to a kind of a training schedule so what might work best for you and when you find that then like you said planning that out day by day across the week I think it's in the times right now it's really about kind of as much as possible and um, having that kind of bit of scheduling and structure in place and you know that today at 12 o'clock I'm going to go out and do my run and if that's my most important thing of the day and the else I have can work around that and um, or if I have to work I can I'm doing that later I think that the plan at the start of the week is a massive one. Um, and if you can, um, I would, like you said, write it down and have it kind of week on week so you are building that schedule. But the first thing I think, then maybe that's probably what we don't do too often is allow yourself to explore what does work best for you. There's probably some silver lining to this time now is that you're not constricted to a certain time frame. You're not, you know, if you don't like training in the evenings, then you can do it earlier in the day. So find that time that suits you and um, kind of just, yeah, like really reset that in stone when, when it's kind of what, what works for you best. But it's, it's a difficult one. I think it is really individual. And um, if you, when you're kind of not having that kind of group environment that we're so used to as well, it, it's difficult. So I think, um, yeah, finding those times that work best for you um, and kind of getting out there and you'll always feel better after it. So I think planning, getting out um, is, yeah, the biggest thing for now, definitely the plan. And making the most of your time while you have it, I suppose, you fun as well, you know? Yeah, massively. I think that's that comes with the planning, especially if you're going out to do a session. If you know in advance, I have to do this session, you'll know how long that will take. If it's a kicking session, if it's a running session, and you can set that time for yourself during the day. Because I think sometimes it's the kind of, we, we feel that we can fit something in, but that's because we probably haven't thought it through enough and kind of worked ourselves around it. Generally speaking, um, there is enough time in the day if, if we use that time effectively. So I think um, knowing what you want to do and making the most of your time, it, it can only be, it might only be an hour and you can have reap all the rewards of it if it's kind of an effective hour. And so, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Yep, perfect. Um, I'm going to go on and, and bring Aidan in now. Thank, thank you, Claire. So communication, folks, I, I think communication, as much as the other things, is massively important in this as well, not just between parent to coach or player to coach and coach to coach there's different different codes as well so communication is the act of expressing ideas information knowledge thoughts and feelings as well as understanding what is expressed by others 
The communication process involves both sending and receiving messages and can take many forms. So you can just see here, folks, how do you rate yourself in relation to effectively communicating with your coaches? So excellent, very good, good, or you can improve and it's where you need to improve. So Claire's just put up the poll there. And I'll try it again. It should be a land in the fortnight. They're all clicking away here, Aiden. Might click excellent myself here just to, to bump the numbers up. <laughs> You should be able to see the results there. Yep, so excellent, 17, 37, very good. 23% good and 23% needs to improve. So I think those that's very high there because compared to compared to some instances we come across, especially up in our province, it can be it can be quite low. So it's good to see that that's pretty high there as well. So communication. So know yourself. How do you like to communicate? So I know myself, I'm always very much face-to-face. -face. It's, it's definitely easiest to send a wee WhatsApp or a text, but you're definitely better maybe saying face-to-face. -face. All players will have their own preferences regarding communication in their own style. So it could be different for each player, but especially if you're maybe a coach or a management team, really develop that rapport with your players so you maybe know what to expect from them and what way they might approach you as well. So create the right environment. When is the right time to talk to the coach? So as a player, do you think is that maybe half an hour before training is about to start. Oh, I can't make it tonight. I have camogie or I have exams tomorrow. Your coach has probably spent all day creating creating a session. So it's definitely let them know well well in advance. I went to America one summer and me and my club manager probably didn't really see eye to eye. And I let them know the day before after we played a game and I nearly sprinted out of the car park. He was about to run after me. It was, <laughs> it's a big regret, but I look back and laugh at it. I, saw, I did the wrong thing. Maybe more in spite than anything. We'd had a few follies before, but it was definitely the wrong thing to do. I should have let him know months ago when I decided to go. So build a relationship with your coach. So share your life, your thoughts with them on a regular basis and remember to listen. So I know that's more towards the player, but as a coach, I would always make sure I speak to every single player before training. Now, it doesn't have to be about football. Some of it will be about football. Some of it could be about night side, could be about school, could be about part-time jobs. But it's just developing that we rapport away from the pitch as well. So being honest creates trust to be able to give honest feedback and voice your concerns. So I was telling Claire earlier on, so I've been heavily involved with sort of dairy underage teams in the men's side the last few years. And we were lucky enough to have a contact at Man United. So we went over to their training base and it was actually Josie Mourinho was manager at the time. And he was just telling us, just be honest. If you're dropping a player, tell them why you've dropped them. You dropped because of this, this and this. Don't sugarcoat it saying, oh, maybe saving you for this or just tell them why they've been dropped. Honestly, it's definitely the best policy here. Action, I have an agreed plan in place to move forward. So honesty equals integrity, equals authenticity, equals resilience, equals performance. So all those wee things add up nicely. So hopefully you can have a performance or a good performance at the end of it all as well. Yeah, and I think, I think uh, Aidan, from your experience regarding player communication, um, how do you, when do you think the best time you would like your players to talk to you if they're, they want to talk about a balance that they're feeling a the shift by? You would definitely at the start of the year, I would always give, I was telling you earlier on too, we would sort of, we have a management team that's big enough, we would look after five or six players each. So you'd maybe go and meet those players, it might be every week, but it would at least be every two weeks. It could be, well, obviously not now, but you'd meet them for a coffee or you would go a walk at their club pitch or you'd maybe just grab a bag of balls and have a kick a bit with them just to develop that wee bit of respect. It's not a coach player thing. You nearly, you nearly just started trying to help them. And we found that players would definitely be a lot more honest honest from day one. And I know myself from taking things and you yourself, Claire, as well. If, if a player comes up to me and says, I'm playing Camogie or I'm playing netball as well as, I'm more than happy because they're going to be doing the work away from that. I'll ring up their netball coach or their Camogie coach straight away and say, well, how do you think we can work this? If you're doing fitness with them, we'll do skills. Or do you want us to do fitness with her and you do skills? So I think if a player has to speak to a coach, I think there's not a coach in Ireland that, that doesn't want to know as early as possible and, and wants to work with that player because 
without our players, we're not going to have any games. And without, without our players, we're not going to have a team. So you're always willing to work with players. I'd like to think coaches would always be really willing to work with players. And like, there's more to life. I know football is all our lives, but there is more to life. People do have to work as well. And there's times girls are going to miss because of part-time jobs. You just you just make best with, especially maybe small clubs. You don't have the, you can't afford to maybe ask them to stay on and play. And I've also seen instances as well that, you know, there's maybe different codes. You know, we would work in urban areas quite a bit and soccer is quite big. And you might have a soccer angle like matches on Saturdays and Sundays, it could be in the same day. What do you do? I would always, I would never push them to, to choose one because I've seen more instances than once. Maybe a soccer coach has pushed them. You have to choose us. Or a ghillie coach has pushed them. You have to choose us. And the girl or the boy is, is feared the other way and chosen the other sport. So I think we can always, we can always work together. But I think... As much as parents need to communicate with coaches and uh, coaches need to communicate with players, I think the players are the key here. The players have to talk, no matter what age they are, they have to talk to the coach and let them know maybe their circumstances because there's always a way to work something out. And Siobhan, have you ever had a, an incident for yourself that you've had to go and communicate regarding, you know, trying to strike that balance where things have got too much on top of you, like maybe exams or you felt like you were training too much? And, you know, have you had a conversation with a coach at, or a you know what way would you deal with it yeah probably thinking back to the most probably obvious time when I was um on the Dublin minor panel and the senior panel at the same time and I was in fifth year in school I think at the time that was kind of the the most obvious kind of time I experienced that that kind of clash and training load and I, I definitely was really lucky that the both the managers got on really well so I could go to either manager and that they would take it from there I'd have to say Sure, they'd know from the off that this is too much training or that we need to find a balance here and that they'd be able to discuss that with each other and almost kind of take me out of the equation. So I think like Aidan was saying there, if, if you would go to a manager from another sport and decide kind of what's appropriate in terms of training, I think that can be really, really helpful for the player. But the first step obviously does need to come from the player. So I think we can maybe build it up a bit and be nervous of, of having that conversation because you might worry that it, it makes you look like you're less committed or, or that you're, you're not willing to make the time. But I think, like I said, um, once you have that conversation, it just kind of empowers the coach to kind of make changes that might need to be made to help you as a player to kind of get the best out of yourself and also kind of takes that weight off you. So should help in that kind of issue around balancing all those requirements. So I think um, if I had to give any advice, it would definitely be to speak to the manager first um, and kind of don't try and just handle it on your own. Even if they, they don't change or end training, just having them aware of that you're struggling with that balance can be really helpful. And it can kind of sometimes change maybe how they speak to you or how they deal with their own certain things. And I think remembering that kind of everyone's human and they'll have experienced similar stresses in their life. So definitely having that open line of communication will be really helpful in the long run, regardless of, of what the issue is. I think the more people know about you outside of football, the kind of more understanding they can be and the better that they'll get out of you as a footballer as well. Definitely, definitely. Um, Siobhan, I'm going to just throw it over to you there yeah. and um, I'm going to let you work away on the next couple of slides. Okay. So I think I have control there, I have the power. And so what I'm just going to chat about a bit is, um, I suppose, possible consequences or issues that might be associated with that um, failure to balance these requirements. So what could happen um, if we're kind of struggling with this? And this is kind of my area of research. So my PhD is looking at um, issues around athlete burnout in Gaelic games. So kind of when we talk about burnout, although we might hear about it a lot, there can often be a misconception that it's um, kind of the same as overtraining or just related to how much you're training. And actually burnout is a psychological syndrome and there's three different dimensions to it. So the first one of those is um, a physical and emotional exhaustion. So part of that is that, um, that sense of being overloaded physically. So the sense that you're training too much. But the other aspect of that is kind of being overloaded psychologically and emotionally. So you're thinking about, maybe you're thinking about football constantly and just the thought of it is exhausting you. So it's that kind of not having a mental break um, as well as the, the physical aspect to it. Um, there's also a kind of feeling of reduced accomplishment. So you might feel like you're not achieving your potential or not reaching the goals that you've set yourself in your sport. And then finally, um, sport devaluation. So you might feel like your sport doesn't mean as much to you as, as it once did. And so generally athletes who are burnt out will experience a combination of these feelings. So it's not just that they're training too much. 
And when kind of we look at the importance of understanding burnout, um, we know that all of us here are involved in sport and it can bring such great joy to our lives and can be kind of a really important and um, kind of enjoyable part of our lives. But when athletes start to feel burnt out, sport can actually be having a negative impact on their life. So in terms of sporting performance, it can lead to a reduction in performance and we can see dropout from sport altogether. But it can also have effect in terms of physical illness and depression, so issues outside of sport. So they're kind of the reasons why it's important that we need to understand burnout. And um, generally speaking, although we kind of understand that these are the key dimensions of burnout, and we might uh, we don't actually know that much about the relationship between those three dimensions and what are the kind of key causes of burnout. So that's something that I'm looking at, and um, specifically in GA players. And there's been a lot of different kind of variables that have been linked to burnout. So levels of stress and um, what kind of motivates you to play sport, your motivational climate. So whether um, the coach is emphasizing improvement or whether it's all about competition and um, sport commitment and demographic factors. So th what I'm going to focus on today is just the, the sport commitment variable, just in the context of this talk. So generally speaking, um, your sport commitment, so your commitment to playing can be driven by enthusiasm and enjoyment, so you really want to be there, um, and that can range up to kind of a feeling of being trapped in your sport and, and that you're kind of stuck there and it's not really what you want to do. Um, but when we look at um, the different variables that might impact those feelings, obviously if you're enjoying your sport more, um, you tend to have that more enthusiastic commitment. And if you see like you're getting valuable opportunities and rewards from playing, um, but on the other hand, some of the issues that contribute to that feeling of being trapped in your sport, one of those is having competing priorities. So like we're discussing now, if you're struggling to, to balance your sporting commitments with those demands outside of sport, that can make you feel more inclined to, to feel like you're trapped in your sport. And it can also um, mean that you might start to enjoy your sport less, which is obviously something that we want to avoid. So if we look at this kind of issue of competing priorities, which we're obviously focused on today, um, there's a couple of issues that um, from my research focusing on GA players, well, I think um, it might be a, a kind of a bigger issue for GA players compared to other sports. So if we look at maybe just kind of your typical week, we're talking about your weekly plan. So this is your weekly plan as a GA player. You might have your club training three times a week and if you're a club player. So if we look at that kind of from the idea that burnout would be an issue of, of training, we know that that probably wouldn't be the case. So training three times a week with a couple of gym sessions might not be actually a massive amount. When we look at GA players, we know that we're all amateurs. So regardless of what level you're playing at, everyone has to have that issue with balancing their training with their work and their study and their college and all the things that we've mentioned here already. In addition to that, um, GA players, again, like we've discussed, often play for multiple teams. So that could be that you play for your club team in your county. You could play for multiple age groups within the one club. You could be playing camogie and football. So those are kind of unique issues that GA players can often face. And the final one of those is that there is no actually designated off season in, in the GA. So similar to, to kind of... Um, obviously unlike now when we're in this kind of enforced lockdown if you play for depending on the teams that you represent you could be training and dealing with these kind of competing priorities all year round so that is um that's kind of the issues that maybe make other priorities particularly or competing priorities particularly an issue for for Gaelic games players so we're looking at kind of what type of impact that has on athletes so the issue of struggling to manage those priorities in in my research um I found that where athletes are struggling to balance their priorities, they're more likely to experience those burnout symptoms of a reduced sense of accomplishment and a sports evaluation. So athletes who struggle to balance their sport commitments with their commitments outside of sport are more likely to feel like they're not achieving their goals in sport and they're not achieving their potential. And they're also more likely to end up feeling like oh, sport doesn't really matter to me anymore. So it kind of can fall to the wayside. I think the important thing to note is that obviously these are things that we, we don't want to experience. But in terms of the competing priorities issue, it's it's not always that there's too much going on. It's what we're discussing today. It's about controlling how, how we manage those demands. So importantly, I think not to get bogged down in the fact that I'm training X amount of days a week when you're when you're on a team and you, you have to follow that train schedule. There's very little you can control from that side of things. But what we can control is issues around the time management we discussed and issues around 
developing goals and maximizing your time so it's it's not so much that the demands are too much it's how we see those demands so the same two people could be training the same amount and for one person it feels overwhelming and for the other person they're managing just fine and the difference between those two people is likely that one person is managing their time and managing those demands better than the other so i think the aim of today and things to take away from today is not that we're because we're probably not going to get out today, go back to the LGFA and change the fixture list. That's unlikely. But one thing you, you can take and you can take forward yourself is the skills to, to implement those small changes that will help you manage your training demands and your demands outside of sport more effectively. And hopefully that's what we get from today. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of a, a little insight into a bit, a bit of my research um, on that. And, and Siobhan, how, how do you, I suppose, um, we'll maybe actually take your thoughts. I'll, I'll let them have their thoughts first on this one. If you just to bring these all back in, folks, if you put into the chat there, how can a player bring balance to their life? So do you have any thoughts on how a player can bring balance to their own lives? Just looking at everything we discussed there or any practical experiences that you want to share in the chat, feel free to comment right there. It's a good one, a good diary. Yeah, a good diary, I think we know is a good, and, and everyone will like a diary a wee bit different, like believe me or not, but that's my diary. And I love my diary because every day is in the same double page. Um, so I can fill it out and I know what's, what's coming up. So some people I like- was, single I spent like two weeks trying to find a good diary that was single page. I literally spent two weeks on Google. So it's, it is really what, what it kind of works best for you definitely yeah i'm the only one in the office the rest of them love the big a4 single pages but <laughs> yeah. i don't I, lo I love being able to see everything and note it down so a good diary is a brilliant one anything else Marion? you're muted there i think <laughs> Have my week as opposed to just doing <laughs> things as they come up, yeah. or communicate with housemates regarding supporting each other's schedules. For example, gym, kitchen, TV. That's that's a really good one. Yeah. So if you're living in a house with ones actually having a, a schedule around it, you know who, who looks after what chores in the house, or who's cooking. If you can share who's cooking dinner, and you can get a night off cooking dinner, and you can fit in a wee bit more time, and you know you're only doing dinner on a Wednesday or Friday, or having that. I suppose that's about communicating as well, and having that open conversation, and them and span in to support you. I think that's a really good one. Definitely prioritize and keeping track. They're down here as well. Yeah. And as we said, I think it's really important because if you prioritize what you want, then set them out as your as, as what you want to get after for that week or that month, then you'll have more of a chance of going that way to, to, to try and balance it all out. And I suppose I'm going to throw it on the chiffon here now. Um, you know, you have a lot going on. You're studying with a PhD, which is huge, huge workload for exams and study. And then I presume when you were in DCU, you were with uh, the DCU O'Connor Cup team, so you were playing college football. Then you were with Dublin, and then you have your own club, Rohini. Um, you know, have you any tips on how you balanced your time? You know, that's that's a lot of stuff happening. Yeah, I suppose so. I at the time I was probably just in it a bit, but reflecting back on those kind of busier times and probably being more conscious of it now, I definitely think the idea of prioritizing things first is it sounds so simple but it is a massive one so not kind of agreeing to do anything or committing to anything outside of those top priorities until you know you do have that additional time so um generally speaking you know you're going to have training on x y and z day you know you're going to have college or work and until you know you can kind of do, do perform at those to your best and and have extra time then I wouldn't have committed too much outside of that really and and I was lucky in that I got um scholarship from DCU so I didn't have to work outside of that time but that just is other things that depending on on your demands those three things could be work college and football are your top priorities and I think it's diff it can be difficult it's not always um it's not always the funnest way to be you know and it's it can definitely you definitely can feel like you're missing out on things but I think if you have that end goal in mind 
that can can ease that feeling so there are going to be times where you can't go to something or you can't do a, an event or see your friends at a certain time and on that week by week basis that can be disappointing but if you're kind of keeping that elevated goal in mind which might be to to make that team or to reach this goal as a footballer I think that that's kind of what what you have to do to achieve those goals I think you can accept that a bit better so I think I think it's probably the best example of burn, not burning the candle at both ends like you said like unfortunately you can't be the the party queen and the, the footballer all at once so it's and it is about deciding what's most important to you and that's equally that's not being a, the, being a, a the best footballer for everyone if that's not you know something that's really driving you that's completely fine it's just about what makes you happiest and if it is if that is football 100% if it's college 100% if it's seeing your friends 100% it's about like you said putting those things into your to your jar first and, and working around that so I think it can be planning is probably the one thing that helps you visually see that but I think before you get to the planning and um, you do need to sit down and kind of make those conscious decisions that if I'm going to commit to play for this team this year, I want to give it my all. And that might mean missing X, Y, and Z, or I haven't prioritized training over other things. So I think accepting that maybe um, balance doesn't always mean a bit of everything. And um, balance can sometimes mean this week is football, just football and work. And then at the weekend, I might have time for something else. So I think, um, yeah, understanding that what what it will take to achieve your goals and then committing to going after that and equally so important stress that it's not the same for everyone so for some people they want to go health leather after something and that's good for them other people that's the worst thing for them so I think knowing yourself knowing that jar of priorities for you um is a massive one I found that really helped me um when I did I couldn't go out all the time in college and I couldn't do things but I knew you know it was important to me that I did well in my degree and I did my football and I suppose I didn't feel like I was missing out because when I had those days where I felt I was achieving my goals that that kind of was what mattered to me at the time so I think um yeah really understanding what's important to you is, is probably the biggest one um, and not trying to just follow along what someone else is doing or what it looks like could be the best thing to do taking that time to kind of really realize what it is that you want and then how do you go about achieving that I suppose and I suppose not just answer. <laughs> not just doing something because you, you're afraid of getting FOMO, the fear of missing out. You know, yeah, exactly. You have to deal with the FOMO. That's definitely yeah. the biggest one. If there's one thing, um, you have to get over fairly quickly when it comes to priorities. It's going to be FOMO, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, de I definitely feel like that. That that's usually one. You're, it's more the fear of missing out than anything. Um, definitely. I think it was important that we sort of reflect on why people choose to play and this, this is research so this isn't something the LGF have invested a lot of research and we have a lot of partners on, on why girls play and why girls train and you can see here in the scale the one to the right is the male and the female and why they take up sports with sport in general and the top four reasons for why they take up sport was fitness enjoyment fun body image friends to socialize for females and um, then which is even more scary the top four for dropping out or other commitments and they're marked as schoolwork and work uh, lack of interest now took up too much time which is what we're saying here or too expensive um and i think what i'm what i'm trying to say here is they're all really reflective answers you can completely see that where people are saying oh no it's too much time too much effort oh i, I don't want to do it anymore and we can be really happy playing at elite level or at a club level or whatever level makes you happy sports you may be about enjoyment um and keeping you fit and healthy and relieving that stress of everyday life um of being with your friends like i know me personally my best friends are you know i've met, met through football you know I, I met in college we played football together we've had the time of our lives and we're still in contact and going to training was enjoying but everybody's different um and and to compete and get better and being a part of a team being a part of a team learns you so much life lessons for going on through work through everything you do you have them communication skills you have that sense of togetherness and um, when you're a part of a team but I think it's important that we all remember if you don't enjoy it, you won't do it. And that's the big message from all the research we've seen. You know, if we're not doing it correctly and we're, we're not finding that balance and, you know, then the lack of interest soon comes in and, and we walk out the door and we leave it. And I just sort of want to emphasize everybody here and every footballer that we have, we're a huge association now. Don't make it the elite. 
you know, we have such a vibrant club scene. Um, but you still have to balance the club scene with work, job, exams. Uh, you, you have the pressure sometimes in the club scene, even if you don't play county, playing even more with three or four clubs or, or a duo club. And all these things still work hand in hand to strike your balance. You know, you still have to look at your priorities. It mightn't be as serious, but you still have to choose whether, look, am I going to go training tonight on a Monday and Thursday and play my match on a Saturday or am I going to go out, you know? They're, they're all things that you have to decide and get your tools to look at it. And I think if you plan and think, and the big thing for me is deciding. If you decide what you want to do, it'll keep it fun, um, keep it realistic. And we talk. that's why I talked about goals at the start. Keep it realistic for what you want and then match it up to what you actually want to achieve. And um, if you work hard at it, you can actually achieve anything. So just have a few take home messages, folks. And then I'm going to ask you is if you have any questions, please write them in the chat and we'll, we'll answer them here now. As I say, uh, Siobhan has a huge pile of experience and even Aidan from a coaching philosophy and a do a bit of coaching myself. Uh, and I've been a player, so I know how hard it can be to balance your time. But what I will want to say to you is, you know, you get a balance in your life between your work, rest and play. Then you have to figure out what you want. And I think sometimes that can be the biggest struggle. What makes you happy? And, and that's what it should come down to in the end. You shouldn't be leaving a pitch every night of the week unhappy because I can tell you it's only going to end up with you leaving sport. So you have to keep that fun in it. You, you have to keep yourself happy. And sometimes, even though you don't like it, sometimes you have to say no if it doesn't suit you, if you're tired or if you're feeling demotivated or you've just, sometimes you say, I can't do that extra session. You know, this is my plan for the week. So set your goals figure out them priorities, where you want to go, where, what are my big rocks that I'm going to put into the jar first, then make time for what's important for you. And I think that's really important. Like for me, sometimes I can be in such a bad mood because something's getting on top of me and picking up a phone with your friend just changes all of that. And um, so make time for them wee things that bring you happiness as well, because that helps balance it all out and helps you still remain being who you are. Or confide in a teammate, you know, at the end, walking off the pitch at the end of a session and just say, I'm not feeling that tonight. I just, I don't know what's wrong with me. And even that we chat can make you, and she might say something to you like, come on, you know, you're just, you just had a bad night or, you know, leave it out in the pitch or you had a great score or a great block. And that might just be enough to lift you to bring you on to the following week. And um, communicate with the people around you. And I think I can't stress that enough. Communication is key. And, and, and I know we say it all the time, but it really is communicating with your, your parents, your coaches, your friends, your teammates, they're, they're all really important to help it ease it. And if everybody um, knows what they're doing, you should be able to communicate. If, if, as Aidan said, he's a coach, I'm a coach. If my players come to me and send to me, Claire, I'm exhausted. I did five sessions this week, or I've been, I've, some, I got the legs run off me last night. I I would be a terrible coach if I say I don't care if you get the legs run off you go on out there and run again and um, run till you drop you know you're not going to find that fun or enjoyment so have that communication and don't be afraid to go and speak to your coach and just say how are you and start a conversation to get that on the balance and the most important thing is find the balance that suits you my balance is going to be completely different to Siobhan's Siobhan's the Aidens Aidens to me so it's up to you to find your balance find your baskets and put your eggs in all the different wee slots and to balance it out so that the, the scale says stays even. Um, so just if you have any questions for us, if you want to throw it in and we'll uh, we'll answer them. That's a good one. I maybe throw that to you, Ian. Um, how can you restart your relationship <laughs> with your coach? Oh, that's, that's a tough one. I would like to think that no coach, people always think coaches hold gripes and all oh, this coach. I, I, I honestly believe in my heart of hearts that a coach is always going to play their best team. So I've fallen out with enough coaches, enough boys and girls have fallen out with me here. It's over straight away. Five minutes later, it's over and you're over, putting an arm around them, having a laugh or having a joke. I would just like to think nobody wants that awkward situation players don't want it a coach doesn't want it so i think you you maybe just nip it in the bud straight away yes maybe after a big match something might happen and a coach might call a player out in something and the player might like it and go back i think the next day a simple text or a phone call and, and it'll all be it'll all be sorted i think the thought of trying to sort it is probably a lot worse yeah. worse than actually sorting it but i think i think you just somebody be the bigger person and pick up pick up the phone and send that text or a phone call and i think the coach or the player, whoever does, would be more than happy to to restart that relationship again. 
Yeah, I think sometimes it, in your head it's more than than what the actual issue is. And if you just actually be honest about how you're feeling, it can help restart things completely. Sean, there's a question in here for you. Um, how do you prefer prepare for a big match day while you're living such a busy life? Probably down to that preparation again, I suppose. So generally speaking, you know that the match is coming down at the end of the week or in a couple of weeks. And um, you know ahead of time what type of work you might have to be done. So if, if there's a big match the weekend, you try and get through the work a bit more effectively that week. So there's nothing big hanging over you and that you're not overly stressed so that you kind of can sleep well. Generally speaking, coming up to a big match training might be a bit shorter. So you might get home a bit earlier and get a bit extra sleep around then. Um, but we probably work to kind of a similar schedule the whole time so that even on a big match week, it's kind of the same as every other week in terms of your schedule. So you're still having the same training nights. You're still kind of getting the same meals in and kind of working to the, to the same kind of way you will be regularly. So in preparation for a big match, it wouldn't be that different. I know that might be a bit of a kind of a, a cop out answer, but you, the couple of things that you would focus on would be sleeping a bit more than you might previously because you might not get as good as sleep before the night before the match if you're a bit nervous. You might try and get to bed a bit earlier and um, you might try and reduce your workload a bit so you're not so stressed that week. Um, and again, just making sure you're, you're eating all your meals. So I think it's probably not that different to, to any other week, but again, that preparation will, will help. And Siobhan, just, I know you've done a lot of research on burnout, so that's probably some right down your field here. If you're feel, feeling yourself, you're becoming demotivated, you know, you can actually, them signs are upon you. What are some things you can do to try and get back on track? Have you any advice? It's a difficult one and it can be very individual. So it's probably not um, a one size fits all here. I think the idea of going back to kind of why you do play. So I think sometimes you might just, be doing something repeatedly because it's kind of what we've always done but if you stop to think and say hey what do I enjoy about playing what has kind of kept me in the sport is it seeing my friends is it um feeling physically active what aspect of it do I enjoy at the minute am I still enjoying that aspect am I not enjoying that aspect how can I bring that aspect out a bit more so for example if you're feeling demotivated now and you know that well, actually, my the thing I enjoy about football is training with my friends and I can't do that now. And um, you could, you know, have a WhatsApp with your friends saying kind of what training are you doing? What training are you doing? Kind of get that social aspect back up again. And um, if that's the thing you enjoy. Um, and then sometimes it might be that you need you need a bit of a break, especially now when when things are feeling like a bit of a slog. So it could be that you need you need a bit of a break to take some time. But I think before you make any decisions, taking that time to think, well, what do I really enjoy about football? When I am enjoying it, what is it that I get out of it? Is it spending time with my friends? Is it feeling like I'm playing well? Is it feeling fit? And see how you can kind of get back to that feeling, I suppose. So like I said, if it is that friendship thing and you're missing that at the minute, how can you connect a bit more with your friends around football? Can you compare training sessions? Can you chat a bit more? And so trying to bring out those aspects of it that you do enjoy can help a bit. Thanks, thanks, Siobhan. And there's another one in here um, from one of our coaches and he says he's a coach and he's wondering how much of a negative it is for fifth and sixth years to not commit to football because of study. It's something that commonly happens. I would think it would enable their studies, i.e. healthy body, healthy mind. What's your thoughts on this? Again, I suppose it is an individual thing. I would have always, I think there's definitely research to support the fact that playing sport is good for your mental health and good for concentration and has benefits that far away, kind of any time taken away from study. And um, so I would always say, I, I played through my even service and I, I would never advise anyone to stop playing because of exams. I think that probably as a coach, you, you can't force anyone to play, but I think making them as aware as possible that you can support them through that process and that you will be flexible if needed, making it as kind of easy for them to commit as possible, I suppose, is the only thing you can really do as a coach. You'd hope that players will understand the benefits they'll get from playing and they'll want to commit, but I think from the coach perspective and um, what you can control is kind of what you're asking of them if you're telling them we understand you're doing your leaving search we can give you x night off when you're overwhelmed i think the problem is that there's like a, a perception around leaving their exams or whatever exams that i need to step away and they haven't even got to that point yet and they're making that decision so i think even leaving the door open and saying we'll just see how you get on you know if it becomes too much then you can step away but i think people are making that decision 
just because six years on the horizon, they haven't even seen what, what the commitment entails yet. They haven't done it yet. And sure, there might not even be exams. So I think people are making these decisions based on what they hear about and how, how difficult they hear it is when the people they're hearing that off aren't them. So they don't know how they're going to cope with it until they're in it. So I think really encouraging players to try it. Sure, if you don't want to do it, then you can stop. But if you stop and then realize you miss it, it can be more difficult to get back in. So I think leaving the door open for players as a coach and really being vocal in the fact that you're going to support them and give them every opportunity. Because I completely agree with you that it's hugely beneficial to keep playing sport, but it's kind of getting that across. People can be difficult when they're a bit Yeah, I think there, there's definitely been research to show that people mm. that play sports um, actually are better at school work. And I think it alludes to what we've talked about today. today. They tend to be better at managing their time. And, and choosing their priorities and then maybe a bit fresher instead of looking at the rooms and I suppose as well on that as a coach maybe you can change your training session nights and I know that sounds crazy but maybe you can do a session on a Saturday or a Sunday or a Friday evening and that way they're able to get out for that hour and not feel like they're, it's eating up their study time or they've had they've all this homework to do and you know they're sitting up maybe to one o'clock doing the homework because they had to go to training and then they had to have a shower and, and I think as well, then as a coach, be a good coach. And, and I mean that is that if you're going to have a session, do an hour session. You can get plenty done in an hour. So start at seven, finish at eight and don't start at seven. Still be on the pitch at half eight, chat to quarter to nine while these kids are trying to do their exams and do their study. You know, I think as you said, it's your be flexible and that will really help keep their mind ticking over and they'll want to come back and they'll want to play and you're encouraging them. That you, you're, you're giving them the, the off to it. Um, I have another wee question here. Ian, you might want to answer this one. Uh, so around that age group, and we all know that under 14, under 15 girls dropping out. Um, if they've just started in secondary school and they're really trying to adjust, there's a lot going on. They're playing dual sports, they're traveling to batches. They want to go home, they get their homework, by the time they get their homework, their education. Um, you know, they're not getting home to maybe eight, nine o'clock at night and the parents aren't happy, then the kids get really stressed, especially if the school works on board. Um, and they're really tired the following day. And then the next minute, they just give up on sport. You know, again, have you came across that? Uh, or is there anything you can recommend? I, I remember it myself, Claire, maybe yeah. going to training and rushing home to revise for exams to get in the university and stuff and maybe not doing anything, thinking, oh no, it's, it's too late to start revising now. It's nine o'clock at night. So I completely know, know, know where he's coming from, where, where they're coming from there. I I think I don't think that's going to be a problem this year because I think it's going to be a very very short season again even with with club club football and I, I think down the line a lot of it's going to go in on my own county it's nearly going to be regionalized everything so you're not going to be traveling an hour up the road I think the furthest you're going to be traveling from now on is going to be your 25 30 40 minutes now I know maybe in smaller counties that mightn't be, be possible but it all comes back down to maybe the time management thing. I remember then getting up at half five and six o'clock in the morning if I knew you had a club game that night or training or county training and I wouldn't have time to revise that night. I was getting up at half five, six o'clock in the morning so I could get a couple of hours study in before I went to school. And then you had a few hours after school as well. And I, I know some people might think that's that's crazy, but that's that's what I did because that was the only time I had to revise because I was in maybe about an hour and a half from my school and it's a big old boy secondary school in the city, which was about an hour away from me. So um, by the time we got home, it was half five. You were maybe going to train at half six and you weren't getting home to, to nine o'clock again. So I, my thing would be maybe to, can they get up a wee bit earlier, especially now since they're not back in school and when they go back, they mightn't be going back to school. I think it's very, it's very FFA and it's very, we don't know what each county is going to do. So I can't give you a sort of, generic answer but it comes back to everything we've done tonight writing it yeah. down and if you have to miss the odd training here or there because you have to get something done I don't think any coach is going to have a problem that sometimes less is more anyway so it's just writing your goals down at the start of the week like the girl said earlier and, and work from there you can maybe see I can fit in a few hours here I might have to miss, miss a session here I, I must speak to my coach at, at the earliest possible opportunity. I think, and I think that's it, Aidan. If you speak to your coach and say, look, I'm up to my eyes, I'm so stressed. You don't want a child to come into you at 14, 15 and feeling they're not a part of the team because they missed the session. You have to have an opened approach, you know, that, that's your arm around the shoulder and say, look, forget about it. Forget about training on Wednesday night. I'll see you at your game on Saturday. Just go home and relax and do your work um, because we have to put people first. 
And, um, you know, the, the, most of them kids that are doing that are, are genuine. They're usually dual players or playing in three or four teams and, and they really don't need the pressure of another session. So it's about trying to balance it. Um, I'm going to take one more question before we just wrap up because I, I know we're, we're going on to the R15 here. Um, and Siobhan, if you would answer this one, how would you deal with not getting played and sitting on the bench all the time um, and, and balancing and how do you improve? I am probably well versed on this one <laughs> the last while. Um, yeah, it's difficult. It, it's a really difficult thing. I think actually it might sound like it's not a question that's relevant to this talk, but it actually is because it really could, does come back to framing your goals. So um, if you're starting at the, at the start of the year and you have your goal is to be, you know, the st starting on a team and that's not looking like it's going to happen, um, it's, it can be easy to get demoralised and think, geez, I'm, I'm not going to get a run here and it's it's not really worth it. But one thing that I found to be really helpful at times when I was feeling that way is to reframe um, how you're seeing success. So especially if kind of you would have been always playing and success to you was, you know, playing and playing very well on a match day. And trying to reframe that. So, for example, if you have a championship season, that's five games or whatever. You have been training for nine months, which is probably, I don't know, hundreds of training sessions. Reframing your success so that it success doesn't look like, did I play in these five games? But how did I perform in these hundreds of training sessions? So I think trying to... Um, yeah, take it down a level and think, okay, again, week by week, so we're not worrying about when the next game is or what happened in the last game. This session, again, what is my goal in this session this week to improve on? What can I contribute to the team in, in this session and this week, whether it be, you know, in a skill session, in an in-house match? How can you kind of push people around you? So I think it um, really is trying to reframe it and kind of it can feel it's not that you, <clears throat> important to note that it's not that you are, suddenly happy that you're not playing because that's not the case you're always going to want to play and that should always be the case but just that your happiness or your sense of achievement doesn't solely rest on whether you play or not so I think recognizing that every time you train you're you're achieving something and whether that be improving in your fitness or improving on a skill set and kind of acknowledging that and telling yourself okay I've improved tonight I've pushed this person on I've, I've added to the team in this way and um, so being able to acknowledge that and not just kind of beating yourself up if you're not getting on a match day so that's kind of one thing I would advise and it can be difficult to do but just one way to frame it and in terms of then um pushing on so that maybe you are breaking into the team I think definitely uh again bring it back to the communication I think that's one thing that um we maybe mightn't do too often is to go to your coach and ask them what do I need to do to to get into this team and try and be as specific as you can so what exactly do you need to improve on? Is it, you know, kicking off your other foot? Is it decision making on the ball? Is it your tackling? Is it your fitness? And that can, again, allow you to structure your goals around those kind of key areas of, of play that you want to improve on. So I think um, in terms of not getting disheartened and um, really know, knowing and hopefully your teammates make feel this way that you are kind of a really important part of the team, even if you, you might not get on a match day. So maybe... 15 to 20 people play on match day but if, if that's all you had in training that's not enough to drive you on for a season so I think hopefully your teammates and managers make you feel aware of kind of the impact you have as a player on the team regardless if you get on in a game but equally really making sure you're pushing yourself to your max so that you're you're doing everything possible that you can to, to put your hand up to, to be in the team and constantly show and that that you're improving and pushing yourself on so I suppose it's kind of a balance between those two I, I, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, no, I it was brilliant actually to hear about the reframing. I just I think it's a really powerful message for anybody. And um, that sometimes you have to reframe them goals or you have to don't let it get on top of you. So it's just great to hear that from your experience there, Siobhan. Um that's us for this evening, folks. And I just want to thank you all for logging in tonight. I want to really thank Siobhan Woods for giving up her time for us tonight. She's been excellent and, and she's brilliant to have on board. And obviously Aiden there with his contribution and bringing his whole skill set to it tonight. Um, if you want to just please, please think about it as an individual and balancing your life to suit you. And if you can take anything from tonight, don't be afraid to communicate and reach out and say, I'm struggling or what are my priorities and look at your priorities and how you fit it all in. Uh, and hopefully it'll be more 
you'll have more success. So thanks very much for everybody for joining us and hopefully mm -hmm. you've enjoyed that session. Um, I might put in a wee link for feedback here. And if you wouldn't mind just clicking on it and providing us with some feedback for tonight's session, it'd be excellent. Thank you.